Podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the CJJA Positive Youth Outcomes Committee webinar series. I am Wendy Davis, Assistant Executive Director of CJJA. Today's webinar focuses on engaging the arts across the juvenile justice system. I would like to thank all of you for taking time to participate in today's webinar, and special thanks to Peter Forbes, Commissioner of the Massachusetts Department of Youth Services, and Michelle Phillip, also with Massachusetts Department of Youth Services, who put a great deal of work into the preparation of this webinar, as well as our presenters for today, who Peter will introduce shortly. For those of you who might be new to CJJA, we are a national nonprofit organization formed in 1994 to improve juvenile justice systems, local secure correctional and residential facilities, services, programs, and most importantly, long-term outcomes for youth and their families. CJJA represents the juvenile system CEOs throughout the United States and various local jurisdictions across the country. At this point, I'm gonna ask Charity Brinstall to provide us with a few technical instructions before we start. Charity? Good afternoon, everyone. If you could please place your audio on a phone and use the PIN number. Everyone will be muted during the webinar. Please type questions in at any time in the question box. Questions will be answered towards the end of the webinar and are encouraged. The webinar is being recorded. A link to the audio recording and the PowerPoint presentation will be sent following the webinar. And at this time, I'm going to hand it over to Commissioner Forbes. Thank you, Charity. Thank you very much. Uh, this is Peter Forbes uh, with, with the Mass Department of Youth Services. I have the privilege of chairing the um, CJJA Positive Youth Outcome C Committee. Um, I, want, I want to recognize Charity, Wendy, um, and the team, Stephanie and Mike Dempsey and the team at CJJA for hosting this um, and all the work that you guys do to, to put, put forward good work. Um, Michelle was already recognized, Michelle Phillips on our team. Uh, Simone Gonsolin, who has been an active participant with the Positive Youth Outcome Committee and is going to be doing the Q&A today. And I also want to give a shout out to Phil Harris, who's with CJJA as a consultant and Temple University as an emeritus professor. He's been part of the team. Uh, today, um, we're privileged to have Crystal Johnson, who's uh, program manager with the Arts and Education Partnership, and Katie Cohn, who's an assistant director at the uh, for education at the Mass Department of Youth Services. And they're gonna talk about um, how art and education, the nexus between art, education, and youth engagement. And I think there's a fundamental challenge for all of us that work in the juvenile justice arena. And that is how do you effectively engage young people? If, because if we don't engage them and they're not in, list, in listening to us, then they're not, they're not gonna be learning and growing and in, in, in being able to take full advantage of what, we, what we're offering. So I think Crystal and Katie are gonna be giving you a glimpse into a strategy on youth engagement that's very powerful. And I believe that Crystal Johnson is gonna start. Thank you, Crystal. Thank you, Commissioner. And it is a great pleasure and we really appreciate CJJA for inviting AEP to come and be a part of this conversation. The Arts and Education Partnership, or AEP, is a national or organization that's dedicated to advancing arts education through research, reports, convene, and council. We support a national network of over 100 partners who share in our mission. And AEP has been supported by the National Endowment for the Arts and the U.S. Department of Education for over two decades now, and is administered by the Education Commission of the state. They are a nonpartisan, non-advocacy education policy organization, and they work on education issues across the pre-K, secondary, and post-secondary workforce spectrum. I wanna thank everyone for joining us today as we take a look at exploring our new work with the role of the arts across the juvenile justice continuum. We plan to discuss the benefits and lasting impacts of the arts and how states, communities, and agencies can employ the arts as a part of their strategy to engage youth involved in the juvenile justice system and healthy and productive programs. Next slide, please. I wanna take a moment to note that when AEP began working in this new area, times were certainly different. 
And AEP has responded to these changes through additional engagement with our partner organizations and increased outreach to organizations working in the juvenile justice space, such as CJJA. The arts can serve as a method of support across the juvenile justice continuum of prevention, intervention, transition, and healing. And for our most vulnerable students, including those who are currently in placement facilities and are unable to engage in supportive and healthy social and educational activities. The arts can help them to process trauma, including trauma as a result of the current pandemic. In addition, as we kick off today's meeting, I can't start without acknowledging recent events and the loss of lives that has led to protests all over the country. We won't dig into that topic today, but I mention this just to ground us in the reality of the importance and urgency of this work. Next slide, please. In looking at a comprehensive body of research, participating in high quality arts education can support lasting positive impacts for youth from early childhood and even into adulthood. It can also provide opportunities for young people to build self-efficacy, achieve personal goals, and determine individual criteria for their success. These impacts extend broadly across the academic, personal, professional, and social success. The arts can also minimize barriers for youth initial engagement and continued involvement in the juvenile justice system through employing approaches at various stages throughout their life. Next slide, please. Through coordination and collaboration, states, communities, and agencies can utilize the arts as a method of support at multiple points across the continuum. Next slide, please. Prevention efforts can reduce risk factors that may increase the chances that youth engage in delinquent behavior or suffer harm. And engaging youth in productive settings can foster cognitive, linguistic, and regulatory skills that can help increase academic and future workforce success. Benefits of engagement in the arts include pro-social behaviors, such as cooperation and self-control, improvement in school attendance, and a decrease in suspensions and discipline referrals. Next slide, please. Intervention strategies for youth who are already involved in the juvenile justice system include diversion programs, alternative school programs, and out of home placement facilities, which allows for multiple points of intervention once youth become involved in the juvenile justice system. These strategies can engage the arts to help students develop social and emotional skills, which play a critical role in their success. And the outcomes from arts participation are dynamic in scope and include students building confidence, having cultural sensitivity to others, and empathy. Next slide, please. Juvenile justice reentry programs help youth transition from out of home placement facilities to their home, school, work, and community through direct support services. Effective programming involves collaboration, coordination, and engagement that at an early stage can help prevent a lapse in support and services for youth. Programming that takes a well-rounded approach to academic instruction and career-centered learning can provide youth with a dynamic skill set that supports successful transition and positive long-term outcomes. Arts engagement outcomes can extend from personal development to broader societal impacts, such as respect for family and peers, and a stronger sense of trust and community. Next slide, please. Youth can experience trauma prior to or directly from involvement in the, just, the juvenile justice system. And this trauma may continue even into adulthood. Trauma-informed care and education practices understand trauma and its impacts 
and they respond by creating a healthy, safe, and a supportive environment that promotes opportunities for healing. These opportunities include arts-based healing programs that can help youth process trauma, improve coping skills, and build resiliency. Providing youth with opportuni opportunities for self-expression, reflection, and healing through a creative process can promote a strong sense of self, help them to build closer relationships, and increase positive engagement with their peers and within their communities. Next slide, please. AEP's recent report on engaging the arts across the juvenile justice system provides multiple program examples to demonstrate all of the positive outcomes I just shared. But now I wanna turn it over to Katie Cohn, the Assistant Director of Educational Services at the Massachusetts Department of Youth Services to talk more specifically about their arts initiative and the impact that it has had on their youth. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Crystal. Um, it's an honor to be presenting here with you and um, just thrilled with the report and the work. Um, it's fantastic. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I have been with the Department of Youth Services in Massachusetts uh, for about 12 years now um, on the education team. Um, I uh, started my, with DYS uh, prior to that as a direct care staff um, at a hardware secure um, young women's unit. Um, and then went to pursue my master's in social work. And um, it's really a thrill to be back uh, at DYS um, and integrating the arts. I grew up as a theater kid. I was a very serious theater kid. And um, the arts are very important uh, to me. Next slide, please. So ever since um, I've been at DYS, uh, the arts has always been part of education services. And um, over the past decade, we've been able to kind of grow our programming um, to kind of impact throughout the system. And I look forward to talking to you about that today. Um, we see a lot of engagement with our young people in the arts. We also see it with our adults that our, um, that the whole community really engages in the arts and creates a learning community that uh, is very, very helpful. Next slide, please. So what have we got at DYS in Massachusetts? So we have um, five visual arts teachers um, who are licensed educators, and they um, are within our five regions and travel around to uh, programs within the regions to uh, provide arts education. Um, we also have an arts residency program, and this program partners with community-based artists and arts organizations um, to come visit our residential programs. And they visit both our short-term detention programs as well as our longer-term uh, settings. Um, and it, you know, every residency is a little different, but they range from six to 12 weeks. Um, the, the projects, a uh, range of different arts mediums, um, but the projects are aligned to um, the National Core Art Standards, um, and the and or the literacy anchor standards, so they are part of the education program, and um, they culminate in a celebration where we invite family, um, caseworkers, and uh, it's a it's a project based. So uh, young people are working towards um, kind of a, a a final could be as informal as just a final class that's open, or it could be a performance that they've been working towards. We also do some work in the community, some community arts partners, um, where we're able to provide some employment opportunities for young people uh, in, in an art setting. Um, we hope to do more of this, but we do find it uh, very helpful for the right young person um, to have a community arts employment learning experience. Sometimes uh, young people will meet artists in a program and uh, will really hit it off and uh, spark will be met and um, we're able to continue with arts mentoring back as young people transition into the community. Um, and we have some relationships and mentorships that uh, maintain with young people uh, over a, a, a duration of time. We also are able to provide, sometimes it'll pop up that um, a young person has a specific arts interest or wants to learn a specific skill and we are able to kind of uh, 
provide some one-on-one -on -one, um, instruction or experiences at different points. So uh, throughout the school year, um, all of our arts programming culminates in our annual uh, showcase. And the showcase uh, titled Share Your Art, Share Your Voice started in 2013 and we kicked it off at the State House. Um, we've gone to a couple different venues, um, including University of Massachusetts in Boston, and we've kind of find our, found our home at WGBH Studios and been there for the past three years. And I think about this as kind of like our statewide um, art celebration field trip. Um, next slide, please. And it's a um, statewide convening where we have a, a team that works um, to figure out which programs and young people will be interested in attending. So this is an example of a poster that would be in a program or in a community district office. Um, and young people have the opportunity to display and or sell their artwork. Um, and we usually have around 300 pieces of artwork that are displayed and sold, um, as well as um, 15 to 20 youth performers performances. So that day, from across the state, young people from residential and community settings, and lots of our staff and key officials and special guests kind of gather, and um, we have uh, an art celebration day. Next slide, please. So here's an example of kind of um, this an art what the art gallery looks like, and uh, young people receive 85% of the sale, 15% goes to framing. Um, we also have visual arts leaders that propose to have a extended gallery section um, who kind of are creating a body of work. Um, all of the artwork have visual art statements. And um, the next slide, please. We also have the, uh, the performances um, which young people arrive at the, um, at the, the morning of, and we do a tech rehearsal, we do everything that day because bringing young people from across the state all together more than once would be too much of a challenge, but it is a really fun day. And here at the Paramount Theater, this was 2016, um, we were able to have, we had a marquee, and so the young people's names um, were up on the marquee. And uh, family comes, uh, and it's, it's, it's pretty awesome. Next slide, please. So the showcase is one of our special events, and I think the special events and partnerships is a key way that we have grown the arts at DYS in Massachusetts. Um, we work very closely with our director of special projects at DYS. Anytime there is like a, an award ceremony or a special staff training, or, or we often are including young people as an artist opening up the day or including visual art to set the ambiance. And that has really definitely impacted kind of how arts is seen as um, a key piece of how we uh, support our young people. Other partnerships we have, we've done some interagency projects, um, such as we partnered with the juvenile court and probation to get, gather a group of young artists to um, have artwork and also a mural to beautify um, a juvenile court. Uh, we also bring, um, we have an arts rally every year at the State House. Um, right now, one of our district attorneys is commissioning uh, one of our visual arts leaders to do a, um, a redesign mural of uh, Lady Liberty. So that's pretty um, exciting for this young, young man because it's kind of a direct commission employability project, um, and it's also a special partnership. Uh, next slide, please. So key, key structures that we have in place that really help um, our arts program. The role of the arts program manager is so key. In our um, education partnership, our workforce development partner, um, we have an arts program manager who's full-time arts background and really helps facilitate our statewide arts programming. We have a very uh, particular procedure for setting up arts residencies really making sure that we're working with the program managers, the clinical staff, uh, getting direct care staff on board um, and prepared for our visiting artists and really just supporting our artists to have high quality programming and to work within our system. 
the arts program manager also provides our artist training, which is kind of a requirement for all of our artists. We have you know, certain policies we need them to review and sign off on, and also just readying them for the setting and kind of providing a community of our artists to uh, work together and support each other. One of the um, key partnerships we have is with um, our legal services department. So all of the artwork that you see here is from our showcases um, from over the years and our young people have signed off um, and if they're under 18 their parents and guardians in terms of were they going to sell their artwork um, could it be used for promotional educational opportunities like today um, and that's a really key piece i think especially in juvenile justice settings because young people um, you know their their rights their privacy need to be protected and we also want them to have the the most opportunity possible and the employability piece, I think, really helps um, the trans transferability of a lot of the skills young people are using, um, both in the classroom and with arts. Adding the employability piece helps on another level as well. So like for the showcase, all the young people who are attending that day um, as a performer, they are being paid for their tech rehearsal and their um, performance. So they're getting a taste of the gig economy. Um, but we're also helping young people work towards a specific goal. The showcase is usually in, in uh, May, and we do, we're working with young people like at the beginning of the school year, oftentimes identifying young people who are visual artists who definitely want to have art in the show or are working on a performance. So they're working on specific goals. Um, and that is a helpful employability marker. Next slide, please. So outcomes, youth engagement and a healthy milieu are programs um, really appreciate the arts. And we have um, at times even utilized arts um, to provide some trainings at programs for direct care staff. Um, we've seen youth engagement at the program level and also on the individual level. Young people who continually come back to the showcase year after year wanting to work on a specific thing um, we've had a we've had young people who have utilized their engagement in the arts to help spearhead their leadership um, young person who has gone on to actually work at dys and then enjoyed bringing a field trip of young people from his program to the showcase also our artist organizations are able to grow with um, the agency so we have some arts partners who um, have really helped us with trainings um, as well as working on figuring out how to partner more specifically and intentionally with clinical services um, as well as our work with racial trauma we had uh, several of our artists as facilitators and presenters because the arts really um, has a lot of opportunity for storytelling and positive identity building and and bridging understanding so key stakeholder buy-in, um, you know, I think having an annual event and having these key partnerships that kind of help spread um, positive messages about the department and our young people who are often trying to work, break down stigmas um, has been really helpful um, with the arts. Um, the next slide, please. So this was a, um, the FY19 budget recommendations for the Senate Committee on Ways and Means. And um, our artwork was featured on uh, the cover of this. And this was just a, you know, it was uh, a big win for us for the arts program that we got to be featured there. And um, validating that, you know, part of why we started the showcase was, was to reduce stigma. And I think that that has been Helpful. Okay. Who was it? Next slide, please. Oh, Josh. So he looks super tiny. I could barely see him over the door when you flip him. And, um, thank you guys very much, Crystal. I'll hand it back to you. Okay. May I suggest that people put their phone on mute because we can hear another conversation going on right now during the webinar. I apologize for interrupting. Thank you, Simone. I appreciate that. Um, thank you, Katie, as well. Uh, I am always amazed and envious of the creative talent of young people. 
Next slide, please. I think mainly because all of my artistic ability lies in the realm of abstract art. Um, and as well, theater has been a major part of my life um, as well, Katie. I struggled a lot growing up with my public speaking and theater has helped me a lot with that. So I appreciate you sharing that sentiment as well. In recognition of these programs, policymakers across the country are beginning to take action to support this work. I'd like to share a few examples with you all, but before I do, it's important to note that our research is centered on the Education Commission of the State's definition of policy, and ECS defines policy as any statute, regulation, or budget language. Next slide, please. We found opportunities on the federal and in state policy, as you can see here. On the federal level, the Juvenile Justice Reform Act has language in their policy to support arts programming for at-risk youth and youth involved in the juvenile justice system. Also language in the fiscal year 2020 commerce, justice, science, and related agencies appropriations has language in there as well to support arts-based programming. Also the Every Student Succeeds Act. And on the state level, Louisiana, Nevada, and Utah all put in their state policies language supporting arts-based programming for youth at risk or involved in the juvenile justice system and detention facilities. Next slide, please. In AAP's research, we found many comprehensive resources related to the arts and juvenile justice. Examples of organizations doing work in implementing programs in this space, like Katie's work with the Massachusetts Arts Initiative. So in part of our efforts to facilitate the ongoing sharing of information, we've created a juvenile justice and arts resource library on AAP's website. I encourage everyone to visit the website and to view this topic resources as it has been robust, getting so much information in such a little bit of time, because there's so many organizations, arts organizations, juvenile justice organizations, and even education stakeholders doing work in this space, supporting arts programming for youth involved in the juvenile justice system. And with that being said, if you are doing work in this space, please feel free to reach out to me and share your resources as we will continue to update this page with topical content. Next slide, please. As robust as our research has been, we are still left with information gaps in the barriers and challenges faced for arts-based programming, identifying the key actors and implementation and how different communities can utilize existing policies for arts-based programming. So to help fill these gaps, we felt it best to convene experts in the juvenile justice education and arts fields to better inform on these issues. So we'll be hosting our first ever virtual thinkers meeting. Next slide, please. The goal of an education commission of the state's thinkers meeting is to gather the wisdom of some of the best and brightest minds on key education issues. And as a result of the meeting, a paper is released summarizing the conversations and key takeaways. Next slide, please. So for this meeting, we've developed three goals to address the gaps that we are seeing. At the end of the meeting, we expect to be able to identify considerations for replicable and sustainable arts-based programming. So what we're looking for here is, can a program that's working great in New York do the same for the youth in a place of Georgia or California. We want to make sure that the program can be replicable across the country. We also want to identify key actors in policy and implementation for arts and education and juvenile justice. So here we want to know who is creating these policies that can help promote arts-based programming, such as the examples that I listed, 
And then who is in charge of administering these programs? And lastly, what staff is needed for the implementation of the programs? And lastly, we wanna consider the state and federal policy opportunities and barriers. Again, we wanna look at the existing programs that we've found and see what opportunities it provides across the country. And then we also wanna see state by state what barriers they may come across because of their state or wherever community or the community, the local community that they're working in. And from them thinkers meeting, we hope that this will allow us to share the best available information on arts education practices within the juvenile justice system. You can be on the lookout for the release of this report um, late fall. Next slide, please. Before I turn it over to Simone for our facilitated question portion of the webinar, I'd like to thank you all again for joining. It is important to keep youth in vulnerable situations in mind during times such as this. And it is our ask that you continue to do so after this presentation. Please visit our website and take a look at the resources that I've mentioned. And do not hesitate to reach out to me with any resources you may have about this work in this area. Thank you. And Simone, I turn it over to you. Well, thanks, Crystal and Katie. Uh, thanks so much for sharing the information with us. And wow, those were tremendous slides. Uh, they were they were slides that I think people are going to want to utilize in uh, PowerPoint presentations to live liven them up. So thanks a lot for uh, giving us that guidance. There are a number of questions that have come in, so uh, I'll go ahead and begin uh, sharing some of those questions with you. The first one is: uh, Are there any key resources on how to integrate the arts? into subject matter content, so such subjects as science or language arts. Do you have any resources that may help the classroom teacher integrate the arts uh, into those uh, content area classes? Thank you for that question. Yes, if you go to the AEP resource page that um, I mentioned, we have a lot of arts, um, arts-based programs and a, a lot of uh, resources supporting arts education within uh, other coursework such as math, science, and supporting that work as well. So if you just go to the resource page, you'll be able to find it there as well. And you can also contact me as well directly, and I can uh, direct you to specific resources on that page. Excellent. Katie and uh, Crystal's contact information was on that last slide. And I know Peter will make you aware of this, but this webinar will be archived so you can certainly access the slides and, and the contact information. Uh, a second question is, can you describe any instances where engagement in the arts has supported a youth uh, in their transition from the facility back to their home community? So any instances where art may have impacted the success maybe of a child's reentry to the community? Yes, thank you for that question. One of our partner organizations, Big Thought, actually has an arts-based program, um, re-entry program, which is a workforce. So what they do is they allow youth to show up to work where they create art, um, and then they get paid for this. And a great part of this is they hold them accountable by letting them know that if you don't show up to work, there's consequences such as you won't get paid for this day. Um, so that's a great program that one of our uh, partner organizations, Big Thought, they uh, utilize to help youth who are re-entering and back to home and society. Great, thank, thank you so much. Uh, and, and I'm sure, you know, if a youngster is very talented in art, maybe they have, um, you know, utilized the programs that are offered to them in the facilities. You know, that's a really nice way uh, as far as the reentry meeting with the home-based school uh, to, to really share that information with that school so that there is a connection to the youngster's art and desire to do well in the arts uh, and will connect them hopefully to their home-based school too. So that's really a, a, a great way to connect the youngster, their interest in the, in the school as well. So we have another question. Uh, can you talk about some of the challenges and Katie, this may be more for you at a facility or agency level, but Crystal, you on a national level, let me start that question over, uh, just kind of giving you that lead in. 
Can you talk about some of the challenges that you have had to navigate as you have injected the arts uh, into facility-based programs? And possibly how you address these challenges? Katie, if you want to start, you can go ahead. Katie. Oh, Katie, thank you very much, sorry. You're welcome. Here I am. Um, so the, I'm sorry, I was having trouble with my mute there, but for a second. So the question was around. Um, yeah, so, yeah, Katie, I, 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 wanted... repeat it. I can repeat it. So, so, you know, whenever you move in a program through a facility, especially if it's something new, you usually have to navigate some choppy waters, you know, typically, uh, maybe not all the time. And this person wanted to know, what were some of those challenges uh, that you had to overcome uh, when navigating the integration of arts into the facility-based programs? Yeah, so so sometimes we've had, um, you know, some, uh, the setup meeting is really key because we're bringing the program manager and the clinical director or a clinician, um, as well as sometimes a shift administrator or someone representing direct care staff. Um, but there's kind of a process in place for um, preparing the program for the artists. Sometimes, you know, over certain content, um, we would, you know, work to make sure everyone's on the same page on, 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 on what material could be used or not. Um, you know, sometimes throughout the program, we may have some uh, staff engagement issues that we, we have to work on. Um, you know, most of the time, the artists are are pretty everyone's pretty excited to have um, a, a guest I think that's why it's also the residency model is very helpful because it's it's a it's a special program visiting new fresh uh, livens it up um, but you know we, we also have to work on you know tools and supplies and making sure we have correct inventory pieces um, if we have new equipment on the unit um, and and we really you know the, the arts program manager will really kind of outline um, step by step um, concerns and usually make a plan. Um, I, I also just wanted to kind of respond to the other question. I tried to jump in, but I uh, around the transition piece. Um, yeah. You know, we we have you know several young people right now who have transitioned from long term treatment um, into the community who are um, working with either an arts mentor or an arts organization, and we find that. Um, this has been really key for supporting transition, both for kind of that um, uh, expanding the network of people, and it's also around what the young person is really passionate about. So a young person who's really excited about their music has um, a, a, a hip hop artist that they're working very closely with, or um, and, and we find that the the artist becomes another advocate, another support another part of the team that has more has maybe different information new information a different perspective to help that young person advocate and to help the team you know kind of really understand what's going on full picture right. thanks thanks Mom. so much for responding to both those questions absolutely good good points um, for sure Chris I don't know if you wanted to add anything or should I move on to the next question I think that Katie rocked it. I okay. don't have any specific examples, so yes, perfect. <clears throat> Very good. So the next question is, uh, how do youth get involved in the arts program uh, that is uh, being operated by DYS? Do they have to express an interest in arts, or are all youth offered the arts uh, as programming upon entry? So um, the programming will vary throughout the school year in terms of when the visual arts teacher is at the, that specific program or which residency may be at that program. But um, young people in all phases of our continuum have the opportunity to um, be exposed to arts programming. Um, so we have you know, our arts activities in detention and as well as long-term secure, as well as um, uh, in the community. Um, so there's that piece as well as kind of our staff now kind of know about the arts programming that we have um, available staff meaning direct care staff as well as caseworkers, education and career counselors. So as young people are exploring through um, their time with us what they're interested in what they're 
uh, pro-social activities they may want to get involved in. So there is a network of um, folks who you know, make, may make the call to the arts program manager or to someone else in the arts network to say, can we get this young, young person hooked up with uh, you know, something that they're you know, arts-based programming or contact. Such a great thing. Thank you so much. Um, Crystal, I don't know if you have any other suggestions. I, I know uh, Katie covered uh, DYS, but I just didn't know if you had uh, maybe another state or two that you may have wanted to mention um, uh, how youngsters typically get involved in the arts. Yes, thank you, Simone. Um, typically in our research, we found that it's on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on the state, um, in the local governments that are facilitating or administering these arts-based programming. Uh, so if you look on our resource page, we do have examples of how different states and different programs are utilizing those policies to implement those programming of those programs and where the youth enter into their program, whether it be a reentry program, um, or an intervention strategy program, uh, those are also listed there. Okay, great. Thanks for giving us those pointers. Uh, so this person is interested in connecting with state educational agency, art education, uh, sec sections within the state educational agency, or with art education stakeholders uh, within um, uh, who, who do in fact promote arts amongst the youth. Is there sort of a repository or listing maybe by state that, that uh, this person could reference? Is that, is that in your resources, uh, Crystal? Yes, the states that we found that have policy um, on arts-based programming and juvenile justice, uh, for juvenile justice, youth involved in the juvenile justice system, excuse me, um, or youth at risk for the juvenile justice system is can be found in our special report. And also in the special report, um, engaging youth um, in, in the arts of the, for the juvenile justice system. We have uh, more description on the policies and who they specifically serve, the youth they specifically serve, as well as brief descriptions on states that we found, such as Utah, Louisiana, and Nevada. Okay, and I think this, this uh, person is asking if you could share maybe a typical policy statement or two, and I, I don't know if that's something that, Krista, you would wanna share, and Katie, or just one of you. Uh, and, you know, you would have to say it verbatim, but, you know, just sort of a, a little uh, summary of what the policy might say, what's in the policy. Of course, yes, I can definitely do that. Thank you for clarifying. Uh, so, for instance, uh, Utah engages the arts as a method of support in the juvenile justice system through high quality credit earning programs to youth who are currently in state custody. So this policy is focused on their arts education. So they could take a music class, a theater class, um, and a performing arts class and earn school credit that will go towards their graduation. As well as Louisiana, they passed legislation to support the creation and use of arts-based programming within juvenile detention and placement institutions. Those are just a couple of examples that I have. Katie, if you wanna share um, any examples you have. So we work closely um, with our education team and um, align the, the project, the arts residency work um, to the National Arts Core Standards um, and or the literacy anchor standards so that um, it is um, credit bearing or it will count towards um, young people's work uh, for their high school credential. So that's kind of part of our whole setup and the, the artist kind of um, mm -hmm. proposes their project and there's a process that we um, do for each of our residencies. Okay, great, thanks so much for those examples. Um, do you have any examples of how programs are supporting students in distance art 
learning during the COVID-19 times and has DYS had to pivot anyway. Their art programs had to pivot anyway due to COVID-19. Yes, so we are we are in process of we we right now our our visual arts teachers have um, Google Classrooms um, for um, their arts uh, work, and we are also right now working on piloting a couple of different uh, virtual options um, with our with our partners. Um, I know we're working on getting a, a Shakespeare um, virtual arts going. Um, and we're working with the education staff who are working on the Google Classroom and the program to figure out how we can do that live virtual piece. So that's kind of in process right now. Um, we do have young people in the community who are doing uh, online communication with their arts mentors. Um, and that's been pretty much consistent through um, since March when everything shut down. So we're still learning, but we are definitely testing the waters and um, trying to work on some plans for next school year that can can be kind of a more of a hybrid approach. Great, Katie, thank you. Uh, Crystal, did you wanna share anything on that particular question or? Yes, I'll be happy to. Um, so we, with some of the outreach that we've done to arts organizations and juvenile justice um, organizations, Austin Classical Guitar, uh, they are a organization who does music courses for credit opportunities for youth involved in the juvenile justice system. They operate off out of um, Texas and they have two facilities that they operate out of. During this time, they uh, initially weren't able to have access to their youth, but they were, in, they were able to gain access to their youth. They were able to continue their, their learning through um, a virtual platform and uh, allow the students to to continue their learning for that, as well as performing statistics um, based out of Virginia. Uh, they're an arts-based organization that focuses on youth advocating their voices. Um, and they are reaching out to arts organizations and spreading information on how they can, how programs are changing and utilizing virtual platforms or gaining access to youth within facilities at this time. Super, Thank, thanks so much. Um, I have another question here, um, and, and this could be for both of you. Uh, how can the arts help in assisting youth managing emotional responses to the current protests uh, regarding uh, Black people and the police? I think that, um, you know, there really all forms of arts, um, whether it's channeling it through painting, drawing, I think of dance, I think of storytelling and theater, I think all of these pieces um, help to create kind of a, uh, a um, direction for um, emotion, feeling, you know, even body experiences um, and giving it a, uh, a way to have a form for expression. Um, so I think that it's 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 really important to include um, arts modalities uh, to help young people express themselves and um, explore their explore the expression um, with adults, whether it's in in programs with us or in the community. Um, I think that the actual art like the, the practice of doing it in art takes the uh, you're using emotional regulation while you're focusing to do uh, storytelling while you're moving your body and dance or drumming or you know it it helps um you know kind of on a on a kinesthetic brain level so i think that the actual use of art um it kind of goes hand in hand with um what we need for regulation And Thank you I'll so add, much. Crystal? Yeah. Yes, I'll add on to that and say that our partner organizations at AEP are doing a lot of work during this time of COVID um, and racial injustices. And I encourage everyone to please go to our website as we are sharing 
this information as well on our juvenile justice and arts resource page, as well as you can go to our partners um, page on our AEP website. As I said, they are also doing a lot of work um, in, in this space at this time. Excellent, Thank, thanks for those resources. Crystal, this next question I think is directed more to you. Are there funding opportunities for art integration into juvenile justice uh, facilities? Any, any support uh, that, that uh, systems might be able to tap or facilities might be able to uh, attempt to secure? Yes, so uh, as I was saying, it, on our, um, I apologize, I was having, I didn't take myself off mute as I was talking. Um, we, we have our partner organizations, including one of our funders, National Endowment for the Arts, who have been promoting the CARES Act, and as, as well as other resources on our page that can support funding and policies um, that we mention in our special report that are currently out that we are mentioning as well. We are still doing ongoing work, and in our thinkers meetings, we're hoping to get more information about funding and how uh, arts programming can be uh, funded throughout the country. Excellent. Thank, thanks so much. Uh, this question is, I think, more for Katie. This is probably from somebody within your agency, Katie, at, at, at DYS. Um, wanted to know if you could speak to the work uh, that you're doing, uh, or DYS is doing, uh, with the Shakespeare Theater Troupe? Sure. So, yeah, um, the Actors Shakespeare Project has been a longtime partner, um, and we've had young people um, in work with them in the community, as well as they um, are ongoing doing work um, in our residential settings. And right now, um, they're kind of our first partner that we've um, matched them with a program who's doing Google Classroom and live virtual um, to do uh, some Shakespeare um, live virtual. So they they do usually work closely with the teacher on, on what play, on what text they want to work on. Um, and, uh, you know, bring it to life. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how it works um, in the virtual setting. But, you know, in theater, there's a lot of, there's still things you can do with uh, mirroring and um, the back and forth. So that's what we're doing right now. I mean, the Shakespeare Project had a longstanding relationship and um, did a lot of work with their um, employment piece and a lot of with mentoring. So a couple of young people I've seen evolve um, with them. Um, and, and that's you know true of many of our arts partners that they've been with us for many years and we have young people that uh, have been mentored for several years. Um, you know, just like you have, you know, your your, kid, your young people who are very interested in sports. You, you know, your your arts young people. When you make this programming available, they 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 find that network and mm -hmm. um, yeah. Perfect. Thank you. I think you both mentioned uh, how the arts can can help build empathy, uh, and uh, so we have a question where uh, the person is asking, "Do you have any resources?" Uh, that you're using, or where might they find resources uh, to really connect the arts to empathy building for young people, uh, given you know the, the times that they're living through right now? Yes, thank you, Simone. Excuse me. Um, we you can look on our resource library, but we also have our uh, tool, Arts Ed Search tool that you can utilize and throughout arts ed search you'll find methods on uh, arts methods where they show how they utilize the arts to help youth develop their empathy skills. Excellent. Th thank you very much, Crystal. And when uh, I think about, oh, sorry. It's no, go ahead, Katie. No, go ahead. Oh, no, just um, in the uh, thinking about empathy and some of the work we've been doing, um, you know, I think about some of the improvisational theater work. We have a partner, Everett Company Stage and School. Um, it's based on, they do a lot of improvisational work and they've recently been integrating their work with internal family systems therapy, which is kind of like you have a family system within mm -hmm. each of us. And um, that has been really helpful for young people because they can work through 
this is my angry part, this is my um, embarrassed part versus, and it's very applicable to theater. Um, so that has been a place where young people have been able to explore um, empathy, connection, emotion um, safely. They've taken more risks than I think expected. Um, just one, one thought on that. Excellent, yeah, thank, thanks so much to both of you. We probably have time for just two more quick questions. I have one here. <clears throat> uh, how do you assist with avoiding gang-related art and what is used to address those issues if and when it should arise there in the classroom or in the, the studio uh, within a juvenile justice uh, setting? That's a great question. Um, yeah, so I think that we're, first of all, kind of upfront um, with young people that um, any game related material is not allowed. Um, so that expectation is set. I think it's also, there's a statement on, um, you know, the submission form for artwork um, that would be going to the showcase or publicly viewed. Um, so we try to make that transparent, first of all. And then, you know, you know our art teachers and our artists um, are, are trained um as much as they can be and we also work with the facility the local level to give them as much expertise as possible um, and that's where we count on the staff partnership as well um, but for our large scale showcase we do have um, a group of um, community services staff who will review each piece to make sure um, and if there are any questions to you know, oftentimes you have to kind of, you know, investigate further to see this particular use if it meant it for this or for that or for that. And um, then we will follow up uh, with the young person and kind of handle individually. Okay, great. Crystal, did you want to add anything to that? We don't have any information okay. to share on that particular subject. All right. So I think the final question uh, will be, um, you know, Katie, you talked about, uh, you know, some programs that y'all have there in Massachusetts. And one thing in particular, you talked about, you know, art sales, performances, uh, and the fact that students receive payment uh, as if they were actors or artists, right? Uh, what is the method uh, that you use to pay the youth? This is a multi, multi question. So I'm going to try and get all three of them to you right here. What is the method you use to pay the youth? How are you able to pay detain youth? Uh, and um, how do you handle the issues around confidentiality if this is an art show uh, for youth who are uh, incarcerated? Uh, how do you handle the confidentiality nature of juveniles being incarcerated in their name could potentially be on the artwork? Those are all such great questions. and. Um, so on the confidentiality piece, so um, in order for, you know, the, in, within the consent form, it outlines that young people will be identified, you know, their artwork will be identified as DYS, at a DYS event, and that their first name would be used. Um, and so they are consenting to that, and their parent or guardian is consenting to that. And if there was ever, um, trying to think of an instance where there may have been times where we just did not include a name if a young person did not want that, or um, for other um, uh, circumstances. But I think that, that, that is a, it's a, that's a big challenge for us because we want to promote, share, and, and in today's world of social media, you know, it, young people want to have that buzz and, and we want it to be a youth development program, um, but we also have to protect the confidentiality. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a policy piece that we talk about a lot and how to navigate that, um, especially in kind of changing times. So it's something we're still working on, but we are always kind of at the partnership with legal services. That's so key. Um, and on the payment side, um, it's a little complicated, so we may have to take, I'm happy to answer more questions in depth um, offline, but through our um, workforce development partner, Commonwealth Corporation, uh, where our arts program manager um, is, we are able to provide um, the stipends um, for uh, the showcase date. So young people um, will receive a check and um, it's a quite a big management process because you have to track uh, where young, if young people are, you know, when, we don't cut the checks until young people are able to access a bank. Now on detention side, so our, deten our detained youth actually do not participate in the showcase. It is for our committed population. Gotcha. Um, so that is a caveat there um, that, that we've talked about it, but yes, 
the payment would be really hard um, if we were not still in touch. Um, so we have one of the challenges, one of the pieces that we, we think about. Well, Katie, thanks so much. Krista, we appreciate uh, your particip participation in the webinar and kind of giving us that national perspective and uh, all of the things the Art Education Partnership has to offer. Uh, you know, that's tremendous and we really appreciate Katie giving us the on the grounds look at the arts within uh, TYS. Peter, I think it's time for me to turn it over to you. We've had tons of questions uh, and uh, Peter will, will close out the webinar at this point. Yes, th thank, you. thank you very much, Simone, for, for an extended q and I think that, was, that really enriched the presentation. Um, there is an opportunity for all of the attendees to uh, complete a survey. You'll see that um, as you exit. And I, I appreciate everybody taking the time. Crystal and Katie, I think you did a wonderful job and I appreciate what, you, what you're doing for the field out there. More to come, I think CJJA is trying to build a partnership with, with Crystal's organization or is in the process of building a partnership. And I think that's gonna be a big uh, piece of development over the next couple of years. And, um, We'll be in touch and we'll be bringing more material forward for the Positive Youth Outcome Committee. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner. Thank you.